हेलो गाइस वेलकम बैक वी आर स्टार्टिंग विद क्रैश कोर्स ऑफ पीडोडोंटिक्स सो स्टार्टिंग विद द फादर ऑफ पीडोडोंटिक्स इन द वर्ल्ड इट इज नोन एज रॉबर्ट सो इट्स रॉबर्ट ब्यूनन व्हिच इज द फादर ऑफ पीडोडोंटिस्ट एंड इन इंडिया द फादर ऑफ पीडोडोंटिस्ट इज बी आर वेचर now we have submucosal cleft palate as you can see over here in the diagram this is a submucosal cleft palate in the submucosal cleft palate we have got bifid uvula bifid uvula also you can see there is a darkness in the posterior part of the palate and which is palpated so we can see the bony notch in the hard palate which is palpated and in the soft palate you can see the translucent zone so translucent zone in the soft palate now teething is when a child's teeth start erupting and when the child's teeth start erupting the child put things in the mouth so there is general irritability and because of that the child eats very less so general irritability also loss of appetite disturbed sleep appetite disturbed sleep diarrhea diarrhea oral ulcers sometimes because of the inflammation child can have a fever so there is rise in the body temperature and the child start biting on things so increase in the biting child feel like rubbing the gums so there is gum rubbing also ear rubbing and gum in inflammation gum inflammation now we give teething rings to the child when a child is teething so these teething rings are never attached to the clothes and in fact they are attached to the neck area so that they are they are not attached to the neck area so that there is no strangulation so they are not attached to the neck and these are attached to the clothing so that there is no strangulation of the because of these teething rings so treatment of the teething is 7.5 ml of topical la we give topical la which is applied maximum of 6 times a day 6 times a day this is maximum and systemic if you want to give we give sugar free paracetamol that is maximum of four doses a day and at a interval of 4 to 6 hourly and for a 3 to 6 month old child when the deciduous teeth start erupting we give 60 to 120 mg of paracetamol and for 1 and 1/2 year old child we give 120 to 150 120 to 250 mg of paracetamol sugar free we give now we have natal and neonatal teeth so natal teeth are see as the name suggests how you can remember about natal is five digits right 1 2 3 4 5 so remember birth also have got five digits so natal teeth are the teeth which are present at the birth neonatal are the teeth within six months of birth so that's the differentiating feature between natal and neonatal so we have syndromes associated with the neonatal teeth so we have craniofacial craniofacial dysostosis dysostosis also we have ellis van creveld syndrome so natal is to neonatal teeth the ratio is 3 is to 1 and females are seen more with the natal and neonatal teeth compared to the males now we have rigafide that is neonatal sublingual trauma 
and in this trauma we see ulcer so neonatal that is because of these neonatal teeth natal or neonatal teeth because of that there is a trauma to the tongue because these teeth start hitting to the tongue and they ulcerate the tongue so the ulcers because of the neonatal teeth are known as rigafede syndrome and that is neonatal sublingual traumatic ulceration very very important point so rigafede syndrome is neonatal sublingual traumatic ulceration these are the ulceration that are present because of these natal and neonatal teeth the most common neonatal teeth which you see is the mandibular anterior mandibular central incisor of course so mandibular central incisor are the one which are most commonly involved with the natal and the neonatal teeth and in fact 85% of the times we see maxilla mandibular central incisors associated with this also this question has been asked in neat 2020 exam so second most common we have the mandibular again so mandibular central incisors are the one which are seen most commonly associated remember and because of that the uh, tongue surface get ulcerated because of these teeth so second most common we have mandibular canine and molars and they are seen in 3% of the cases only and then we have least common are the maxillary canines and maxillary molars only 1% of the case we see neonatal natal teeth associated so as you can see natal teeth over here in this picture based image also you can get question in the picture based image also so remember that most commonly associated teeth natal and neonatal are the mandibular central incisors and that is again very important topic so movement leading to the teeth eruption divided into three phases we have the first one is the pre eruptive phase before eruption then we have pre functional eruptive phase and then we have functional eruptive phase functional eruptive phase also known as post eruptive phase now as you can see over here we have gubernacular canals here and this is again image based question asked in neat 2021 now a uh, gubernacular cord is when the tooth is erupting so this cord guides the erupting tooth so it tells about the motion in which the tooth should erupt or the direction in which the tooth should erupt so it guides the tooth it's guy it guides the tooth in its eruptive movement then we have bone surrounding the apex of the root is known as fundic bone initial resorption of the primary molars they start at the interradicular bone so begins at interradicular bone and followed by resorption of the adjacent surface surface of the root of primary teeth so remember pulp plays a passive role in the resorption now the permanent incisor develops lingual to the a pical one third of the primary root therefore resorption is always in occluso labial direction for permanent incisors so permanent incisors when they are erupting they erupt lingual to the primary incisors so we have primary incisors and the permanent incisors they erupt lingual to it then we have premolars they develop in the furcation areas so when we talk about permanent incisor they erupt in the direction lingual to the primary when we talk about premolars 
they erupt in the furcation area of the primary molars see primary molars are going to get replaced by the premolars right so when the primary molars are there in between the furcation area we have the premolars erupting in those particular areas when we talk about occlusal anatomy for primary maxillary first molar we have mesiolingual cusp which is the largest cusp followed by we have mesiobuccal cusp followed by the distobuccal cusp when we talk about mandibular first incisor primary see primary first molars both maxillary and mandibular the mesiolingual cusp is the largest cusp when we talk about second molar primary for primary maxillary second molar we have mesiolingual cusp which is the largest and also remember in the mesiolingual cusp we have additional cusp in maxillary second molar primary teeth that that is deciduous second molar we have additional cusp present in the mesiolingual area that is known as cusp of carabelli so as you can see we have additional cusp present in the mesiolingual area the small cusp is the cusp of carabelli which is associated with the pr primary or deciduous maxillary second molar then followed by for deciduous or primary second molar maxillary the largest cusp is the mesiolingual cusp and also we have additional cusp present in the mesiolingual and the distobuccal as well as mesiobuccal are almost same dimensions then we have distolingual cusp which is the smallest one when we talk about primary or deciduous mandibular second molar the distobuccal cusp is the largest cusp and followed by we have mesiobuccal cusp followed by is the distal cusp which is the smallest cusp when we see the fine motor milestones in the child for a 3 month old child the palmar reflex is lost so palmar reflex is when a small child when a uh, any object the child sees then there is a reflex of holding into the hand so that is a palmar reflex so hold the object when placed in the hand and it appears by 28 weeks and disappears by 3 month so palmar reflex is lost at 3 months that is child holds the object when placed in the hand so it's a primitive re reflex present at the time of the birth at 4 month child tries to reach for object and at 5 months there is intentional holding of object so if a child wants to hold a object that is known as by dextrous by dextrous grasp that is intentional holding of object 5 to 6 month we have disappearance of moros or startle reflex so startle reflex is child spread out the arms while crying so that is a protective reflex and this reflex is lost or disappeared by 5 to 6 months right so uh, the moros or startle reflex starts at 28 to 38 weeks of gestation and if it is present above 6 month then the child may have cerebral damage so it's a sign of cerebral damage if the startle reflex or moros reflex is present even after 6 months for 7 month of child can transfer the object 7 to 8 months we have parachute reflex so parachute reflex is when 
a child is about to fall extend the arms and it is still present so if you are about to fall you are going to hold yourself from the arms so arms are going to protect the body so it's a again protective reflex so parachute reflex is when about to fall uh, arms are extended and it never disappears it persists throughout the life so persists throughout the life that's a parachute reflex start at 7 to 8 months at 9th 9th month we have pincer grasp so pincer grasp is when a child can hold something from the finger index finger and the thumb like this so that's a pincer grasp so at 9 months the child has got immature or assisted pincer grasp assisted pincer grasp and in 12 months the child has mature or unassisted pincer grasp pincer grasp very important guys the startle reflex so it start in the gestation 28 to 38 weeks and it is spreading out the arms while crying so the moro or startle reflex they disappear by 5 to 6 months of age remember the moros or startle reflex disappear by 5 to 6 months of age then we have the palmer reflex which disappear by 3 months so remember both of these reflexes and all these reflexes now a child tries to hold the object hold his head stable by 6 to 7 months of time and early head control is seen by 3 months and complete head control by the child is seen by 6 months of age presence of siblings have got maximum effect on a 4 year old child and if a child doesn't talk by 3 years of age then we call there is speech retardation the commonest teeth involved in transposition is the maxillary canine and first premolar then the sequence of eruption of a maxillary permanent is first the first permanent tooth that erupt is a first molar the first primary tooth that erupt is the mandibular central incisor so the first uh, the first permanent teeth that erupt is a first molar so we have 6 1 2 then 3 is the canine so in the maxilla canine erupts later in the mandible the canine erupts prior to the premolars so in the maxilla the premolars erupt first so 6 1 2 then we have 4 5 after both the premolars erupt then we have canine erupting for maxilla 3 and then the second molar 7 then for mandibular sequence of eruption is 6 1 2 3 4 5 and then 7 so can i erupt first for mandible for mandible the premolar erupt first injury to the primary teeth is most commonly seen in 1 and 1/2 years of age and dental trauma likely to occur at 7 to 12 year of age the severity of malformation that is because of the trauma is decided by the duration intensity frequency and the direction of trauma then tissue tardis when there is a delayed eruption of the primary teeth mean daily eruption velocity is 71 micrometers per day so that is the eruption velocity root completion of primary teeth completes by 3 to 4 years of age and in absence of any succedaneous teeth the roots of primary second molar most likely resolve slower than the normal see if there is absent succedaneous teeth then the root of 
primary molar will resolve slower because when the tooth is erupting it is letting the primary teeth resorb faster so when there is no succedaneous teeth present then the resorption process will little bit slow down the bite wing film which we use for a primary teeth is number 0 film and remember that the bite wing fil film is the most acceptable method of detection of caries in the children in the private practice or general practice recommended brushing time for children who are under the supervision of the parents is 1 minute so that is the recommended time then the brushing technique which is used in the preschool is fonts technique which is the circular way of brushing so remember brushing in the preschool is fonts technique you can remember fonts circular like that so mean time to change a toothbrush for a children is 3 min 3 months and at which age the child is advised to use a toothbrush is 0 to 1 year of age reconstruction papilla is present 1 mm below the free gingiva in the mandibular canine so it is present lingual in the mandibular canine so it is present 1 mm below the free gingiva lingual to the mandibular canine so it is present lingual to the mandibular canine 1 mm below the free gingiva and it is present in 85% of the children and this reconstruction papilla decreases with the age dentistry for adolescent is known as e febodontics adolescent so what is the adolescent age group is 14 to 20 years and this is asked in neat 2016 exam neonate is till the child is 4 weeks so remember neonate is about 1 month of time period and natal teeth is when the teeth erupts at the time of birth neonatal teeth are when the teeth erupts after 1 month or within 1 month so neonate is one month of time that is four weeks of time again the question has been asked in neat 2016 exam now anesthesia in the mandible most successful in the primary first molar and inferior alveolar nerve block is recommended in the children of 6 years of age absolute contraindication for extraction is hemangioma and av fistula av fistula during the operative procedure chair is positioned that is fully reclined and when the child has got a habit of bed wetting then it is best treated by bell alarm any urases also they can give you for bed wetting so uh, the primary teeth begin to calcify by age of 4 to 6 months intrauterine so they begin to calcify within the uterus intrauterine 4 to 6 months and when they complete the calcification process the primary teeth completes the calcification process by 1 year after the birth then we have periodontic triangle given by right which consist of child at the top of the triangle and we have mother and dentist included in the triangle also the environment then we have modification of this triangle when society is added to this triangle by mcdonald so society is added in the modified periodontic triangle given by mcdonald for a 3 year old child if they ask or they can ask for a preschool child the best time to have appointment is in the morning 
for a older child the best time to have appointment is in the afternoon so fear in a 5 year old child is because of aggressiveness it can cause aggressiveness in the clinic so in a 5 year old child fear can cause aggressiveness in the clinic and a first year the first visit if a child has come to dental clinic for the first time so first visit anger is easy to treat then fear fear is more dangerous so uh, anger is easy to treat then a fear without a stimulus or previous experience and the parent influence is very very important for a child for a child of less than 4 years the parents should be accompanied and for a child of more than 4 years the parents can be separated so then we have different kind of fears we have the innate fear which is acquired soon after the birth this is the fear child is born with then we have objective fear which comes from the own experiences and this has been asked in neat 2018 exam then we have subjective fear so subjective when we talk about a subject and that particular subject can be a family member or friends so usually a family member so subjective fear is fear of a 6 year old child and it is difficult to overcome difficult to overcome then we have imaginative fear that becomes more greater with the age imitative fear is when we observe any of the family member especially mother so child is going to act just like that family member or mother if a mother is scared of injections and if a child sees the child is going to imitate his or uh, her mother so the child will react same according to the mother same as the mother subject suggestive fear is observing fear from the same object so for a 1 2 3 years of old child 3 1 2 3 year old child we use lap to lap technique or knee to knee exam we do so for 1 2 3 year of old child we do lap to lap technique or we do knee to knee technique in this dental chair is not required so the child is in the knee or lap of a dentist and then we do the examination and the treatment anticipatory guidance is counseling for the patients counseling for the patients and parents on prevention of dental disease so counseling the parents regarding the patients uh, on prevention so that is anticipatory guidance now we have the first dental visit it should be at first year either at first dental visit should be either at the first year or 6 six, six months within the eruption of the primary teeth so 6 month within the eruption of the first primary teeth or after one year should be the first dental visit guys very very important point first dental visit should be within first year or 6 month or after the eruption of the primary teeth then we have the frankel behavior rating scale given in 1962 very important is the first that is definitely negative now as the name suggested definitely negative means that child is going to refuse to the treatment refuse to the treatment and we see fear in this child so cries forcefully 
the child cries forcefully and is going to refuse to the dental treatment remember if in the question they say child refuse the dental treatment then it is a definitely negative frankel's 1962 behavior rating scale for negative is when the child is reluctant to the treatment so be careful on reading the question if a child is reluctant to the treatment reluctant to accept the treatment then it is a negative child if a child cries forcefully and refuses the dental treatment it is definitely negative so definitely negative is certain time asked in the question and it is very very important asked in the need 2020 exam as well so definitely negative is when the child refuses the treatment cries forcefully negative is when the child is reluctant to accept the treatment that is negative so it has got a child has got a slight negative attitude for the treatment positive is when the child accepts the treatment but may become uncooperative then definitely positive is when the child is interested in the treatment and understands the treatment it which is hardly seen in any child so that is a definitely positive behavior remember definitely negative is when the child child cries forcefully and is reluctant to the dental treatment very important now we have lampshire gave seven categories that is cooperative tense cooperative tense cooperative is see cooperative is when the child accept the treatment is cooperated towards the treatment tense cooperative is when the child is tense so it is uh, the child is nervous and between positive and negative attitude the child has got so more than or equal to 7 years of age if the child is tense cooperative then we can apply tell show do technique if the in the question is asking if the child is 7 years or more than 7 years tense cooperative child how can we modify behavior or treat us via the tell show do technique outwardly apprehensive child is when the child is standing behind the mother that is outwardly apprehensive fearful child in a fearful child we can do tell show do technique or desensitization desensitization or we can do modeling so that is the behavior modification uh, behavior modification techniques in a stubborn or defiant child the child is going to be very stubborn hypermotive child uh, will be hyperactive then we have handicapped child can be physically mentally or emotionally handicapped so at the child first birthday his weight is 300% of his weight at the birth and increase in the weight seen after one year to 200% compared to his weight at the time of the birth so coming to the mother child behavior interaction if the mother is dominant then the child is going to be shy and submissive if the mother is over indulgent then the child is going to be aggressive demanding and will have temper if the mother is under affectionate not loving then the child will have a shy behavior the child will behave very well but the child cries very easily if the mother is rejecting suppose in case um, mostly seen with the girl childs so the child is going to be disobedient if the mother is re rejecting overactive and aggressive aggressive child is seen with over indulgent mother as well as rejecting mother for an authoritative mother who is very authoritative so authoritarian mother the child is going to be evasive that is child will avoid the situation or child is going to escapes from the situation or dwaddling behavior that is very slow child these are then we have behavior management so in behavior management we'll talk about 
non pharmacological we have three ways either we can communicate the child it can be verbal or non verbal like pats or praises or it can be both then we have behavior shaping so in behavior shaping we have desensitization so desensitization in the desensitization we are going to study tell show do technique right which is given by adults and uh, adults done in 1959 so in the desensitization behavior shaping we study three things one is desensitization then we study modeling which is given by bandura in that we put models in front of child like posters or video tapes and then we have contingency management so contingency management we have punishments or we have uh, reinforcement in contingency management then uh next one is behavior management so there are three behavior shaping techniques desensitization then we have modeling modeling given by bandura in desensitization we have tell show do technique so behavior shaping we have three desensitization in the desensitization we have tell show do second is uh, second is modeling given modeling given by bandura and third is contingency management so it is similar to the operant conditioning theory of skinner so that is we have apply and remove in that we have punishments and reinforcements uh, so these are behavior shaping three behavior shaping then behavior management which is uh, to see behavior management is to install a positive dental attitude so when you want to install a positive dental attitude then we use these behavior management techniques so audio analgesia or white white noise is when when you put pleasant music in the dental clinic and that is going to distract the child from pain or any fear then we have biofeedback in the biofeedback we manage bp ecg so or emg so basically we are detecting fear via all these techniques then we have humor humor is the technique is uh, tv playing cartoons in the tv so that is a distraction technique hypnosis we have hypnodontics then copying assimilation we have got behavior and cognitive and aversive conditioning we have two home technique that is hand over the mouth hand over the mouth technique and we have physical restraints that is we tie uh, physically child to the chair so these are behavior management technique behavior shaping technique we have studied three techniques in that we have studied about desensitization tell show do second is we have studied about the modeling given by bandura and third one is the contingency management so uh, when we talk about these technique remember contingency management includes reinforcement punishment punishment and extinction so in the behavior shaping first of all uh, certain times they can ask you such a question like technique for altering a child behavior to get desired behavior in a dental clinic so that is a behavior shaping technique and this the same question asked in neat 2020 exam also remember see uh, when we talk about contingency management so in the contingency management that is apply and remove so if you apply a pleasant stimulus that is you can give toy to a child or you can uh, praise a child so that is going to be a pleasant right so that is positive reinforcement if you remove the pleasant stimulus that means if you uh, take out a toy of a child so that is going to be a negative punishment you are going to punish the ch child if you apply unpleasant stimulus that is you are going to punish the child so apply is always positive remove is always negative when you apply unple unpleasant so that is you are going to punish the child when you remove unpleasant that is going to be negative reinforcement so removing a pleasant stimulus after a particular response for example if a ch if a child mother is by the child side 
and if the child is not appropriately behaving in the dental clinic then you ask the mother to go out of the or you send the mother out of the clinic so that is removing uh, removing the stimulus after a particular response when the child is not appropriately behaving in the dental clinic then you send the mother so this particular kind is known as omission that is removing a pleasant stimulus after a particular response is known as omission so if you take child toy when the child is not appropriately behaving in that case it will be known as omission so after a particular response after a particular response when you remove a pleasant stimulus that is known as omission and is it has been asked in neat 2018 it has been asked in neat 2020 exam so very highlighting point that is removing a pleasant stimulus which is after a particular response so if they give give you a condition that after inappropriate behavior after inappropriate behavior if you remove a pleasant stimulus that is going to be known as omission remember that is going to be known as omission very important asked in neat 2018 neat 2020 exam so coming to the behavior shaping technique now that we have studied about contingency management we'll talk about desensitization technique guys very 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 important so desensitization technique is to remove the previous fear if you want to remove the previous fear you use desensitization technique which is demonstrated by james and popularized by joseph wolf so demonstrated by james popularized by joseph wolf they can ask you which technique james and joseph so you can say desensitization technique so you basically remove the fear remove the previous fear or you remove the anxiety desensitization technique is used in the first visit so they can ask you which technique is used in the first visit that is desensitization technique we use tell show and do technique we tell the child what we are doing show the child uh, how we are going to do and then do it so that is tell show do technique given by edelston in 1959 so tell show do technique given by edelston in 1959 remember this is a behavior shaping technique desensitization first visit remove anxiety remove previous fear and this tell show do technique because you are going to make the child understand the treatment what you are going to do so it is done in more than or equal to 7 years of age of child so child should be mature enough to understand the things you are going to tell the child so more than or equal to 7 year of old child we use tell show do technique we tell show and then we do it this is a technique used for a fearful child now certain times they ask you question like what if the child is blind then we use touch taste and smell so since the child is blind even if you are going to say even if the child can hear but child cannot see so that is why you let the child taste and touch and then ch the child can also smell so touch taste and smell touch taste and smell technique for a blind child for a blind child we use touch taste and smell so tell show do technique more than 7 year of old child fearful child and tense cooperative child t for tell show do t for tense cooperative tense cooperative modeling which is given by bandura so that is you can also show live models like if another child is behaving well 
So that can be act as a live model. It can be a poster, audio visual aid. It is going to eliminate the child's fear. Contingency management is based on the Skinner's operant theory. So the same chart or same table we are going to draw for a Skinner's operant conditioning theory. So the most realistic approach to manage a difficult child is recondition the child. Recondition the child. First book on the child dentistry is given by Joseph Harlock. Then for a child of more than three years, first visit and fearful child usually aggressively behaves. We do tell show do technique for more than three years of old child. For an afraid child, first thing you are going to do is identify, identify the fear and then permit the child to express the fear. To express his or her fears. Then physical restraints is the last resort guys. It's the last thing. So you have to take consent from the parents also for hypermotive, stubborn, defiant child. We have to use a physical restraint technique. You can use either a passive technique or active can be either done by a dentist or by parents or mother. So if you want to restrain the body, we use pedi wrap or pepos board. Or you can also use sheets to tie the child. Also bean bag and straps. Towels and tapes. Towels and tapes. For extremities you can also use towels and tapes. Or you can use posy strap. Or you can use a velcro strap. For head, which is most frequently asked in the questions, for head, you either use head positioner. So that is a kind of strap which is tied. So head is going to be in a place. So that is a head positioner. Or a forearm body support. So forearm body support is... When from your forearm, you are going to restrict or restrain the head of a child. So that is a forearm body support. Voice control is when from your voice, you are going to make the child behave proper. So by raising your voice and uh, see physical, uh, these all these hand over mouth technique or physical restraints, all these are used as as. At the last that means when the child is not behaving properly so voice control is indicated for a 7 to 10 year old child who's uncooperative and voice control is contraindicated for less than three years of old child or if the child is disabled you cannot use disabled euphemisms are the word substitute so that the child can understand so for air, it is wind for impression material, pudding or mashed potato for anesthetic sleepy medicine or water. For burr, you can use pencil or brush. For caries, sugar bugs. For explorer, tooth counter. For evacuator, vacuum pump. X-ray is the camera. And radiograph is a picture. Handpiece is whistling train. High speed hand piece is whistle because you know certain time they can confuse you. Hand piece high speed is the whistle and slow speed is motorcycle. Then we have hand over mouth technique. So hand over mouth technique should be for 20 to 30 seconds. For ever it is an aversive conditioning. Aversive conditioning we have studied too. One is hand over mouth technique, another one is physical restraints. 
देन इट इज ऑल्सो नोन एज इमोशनल सरप्राइज थेरेपी इंडिकेटेड फॉर अ थ्री टू सिक्स ईयर ओल्ड चाइल्ड एंड कॉन्ट्रा इंडिकेटेड होम टेक्निक इज नॉट यूज वेन द चाइल्ड इज इमेच्योर or it is not used by a handicapped child i mean for a handicapped child or it is not used for a frightened child this technique is given by evangeline jordan then how do we treat a mentally retarded child so when a mentally retarded child comes to your clinic for the first time you give a tour of the dental clinic before starting the treatment and then we introduce patient to the staff we give one instruction at a time to the child and after completion of every task we keep complimenting the child we schedule the appointments to the early morning and then we Uh, put this child as a any other child like a normal child we but we have to respond inconsistently short attention spans are given and the child are usually restless and hyperactive and uh, very important to consult the physician also now this is a picture of tongue blade so which is used to depress the tongue in the mouth so used to open the mouth then we have a picture of molt mouth prop but disadvantage is it can use it can do palatal ulceration or lip ulceration then we have bite block rubber bite blocks also you can use finger guard then we have for body this is a pepos board so it's a pepos board to restrain the body then we have another to restrain the body is pedi wrap for extremities we have studied about the posi straps and the velcro strap velcro strap for head we have studied head positioner so this is a head positioner also forearm body support or forearm support is most frequently asked that is also used to restrain the head now talking about the theories of child psychology we have two theories of child psychology psychodynamic theory and theories of learning and behavior so theories of child psychology Uh, uh the psychodynamic theory the psychodynamic theory first one we have is the psychosexual theory given by sigmund freud these scientists are very important then we have psychosocial theory given by eric erikson eric erikson then we have cognitive theory given by jean piaget theories of learning and behavior development we have hierarchy of need given by masler this is self actualization theory then we have social learning theory which is observation by learning so we observe what happens in the society and we learn from the society that is social learning theory given by bandura so in the bandura we have also study i mean bandura we have also studied the modeling right which is a behavior shaping so in the behavior shaping also we have studied about the desensitization in the desensitization we have studied tell show do we have also studied modeling and contingency management so contingency management is similar to the classical conditioning right and modeling is similar to the social learning theory so likewise we can remember so the social learning theory given by bandura and classical conditioning theory given by ivan pavlov so class i'm sorry operant conditioning theory is similar to the 
operant conditioning theory is similar to the what we have studied in the behavior shaping. So operant conditioning is given by Skinner. It's not classical conditioning. Classical conditioning is the dog bell experiment. So that is when the bell rings, the uh, dog starts salivating. So that is conditioned stimulus on the salivary response. So operant conditioning theory, in the operant conditioning theory given by Skinner, we have pleasant, unpleasant and apply and remove, right? So positive reinforcement, positive punishment. See, if we apply pleasant stimulus, it is positive reinforcement. If we remove the pleasant stimulus, it's a punishment. So that is, if we remove the pleasant stimulus, it is negative punishment. And if we apply the unpleasant stimulus, it is positive punishment. If we remove unpleasant, that is negative reinforcement. So when we talk about psychosexual theory, which is given by Sigmund Freud, Psychosexual theory given by Sigmund Freud, there are two models. One is topographic model. In the topographic model, we have iceberg concept. That is 10% of what is visible and rest is hidden. So 10% of the mind is conscious mind. Rest 90% is the unconscious mind. In the psychic model, in the psychic model, we have id which works on the pleasure principle that is if we want anything doesn't think of anything else we have super ego so which is super ego super ego is the policeman that is based on moral and values and in between that is mixture of both of these is the ego which behaves on reality works on the reality principle so that is a psychic triad or psychic model then we have stages five stages of psychosexual segment fraud theory so oral stages between one to two years of age that is satisf satisfaction in a child is due to the oral desires yeah, either you neglected overprotected are going to uh, develop habits in the child so if orally fix if the child is not orally fixated that is if the child's oral desires are not fulfilled at one to two years of age then the child can develop into nail biting alcohol all these habits then anal stages two to three years that is the potty training stage phallic stage is three to five years in the phallic stage, we have two complexes. Oedipus's attraction of mother for the boy. That is attraction of mother for a boy child. So that is uh, on the king Oedipus, right? So the king, in the king Oedipus, killed the father and married to the mother so that is how that's how the name oedipus so the phallic stage we have oedipus and electra oedipus is for the boy that is the attraction of uh, the attraction towards the mother attraction of boy towards the mother that is boy is attracted for his mother then we have catastration anxiety that is fear of losing penis electra is attraction of father for the girls yani that means attraction of girls towards the father that is electra so we have penis envy latency phases between 6 to 12 years of age and 6 to 12 years of age is the time of the mixed dentition period right so mixed dentition period that is where the character development of the child takes place maturation of ego personality development all the things happens in the latency period also latency period is 6 to 12 years that is the mixed dentition period genital is when the reproduction happens then we have cognitive theory of the gene piaget so in the cognitive theory we have assimilation assimilation is assimilation is 
a new information so when a child tries to grasp a new information we also have accommodation that is any change in the old information say suppose if you start teaching a child about essay of the cow so he first starts to learn about a cow then he starts on keep on adding new new information about a cow so any new information is assimilation and any update or change in the old information that is accommodation and equilibration is both of them so there are concepts or strategies in this theory which are known as schemas so we have four phases in the cognitive theory of jean piaget the sensory motor phase or stages between 0 to 2 years that is when the child plays with the toys so that is known as a symbolic play symbolic play sensation for any sensation the child acts or plays then we have pre operational stage that is between 2 to 5 years in that we have animism animism we have construct constructism illogical thinking or egocentrism then the concrete operational stage is between 6 to 12 year again 6 to 12 year is the mixed dentition period concrete operational stage is when the child thinks logically so logical operational stage or logical thinking formal operation stage is development of any reasoning capacity between 11 to 15 years now talking about the development of dentition we have initiation of odontogenesis so at the third week intrauterine life there is a thickening of epithelium thickening of epithelium at the sixth week intrauterine life very important development of dental lamina dental lamina so development of dental lamina occurs at 6 week intrauterine life then the nola stages of the tooth development so zero stages when the tooth development has not started that means there is absence of crypts stage 1 is when there is presence of crypts stage 2 is initial calcification stage 3 is when one third of the crown is formed stage c remember two things stage 6 is when the crown is completed and stage 10 is when the root is completed right remember two things stage 6 is when the crown is completed so stage 6 is when the crown is completed and stage 10 is when the root is completed now we'll go accordingly so stage 4 is when 2/3 of the crown is completed and stage 5 is almost the crown is completed almost the crown is completed stage 6 is when the crown is completed and stage 6 is the stage in which the tooth shows eruptive movement so eruptive movements begins at stage 6 again question stage 7 is we know that stage 6 is when the crown is completed stage 10 is when the root is completed so stage 7 is when one third of the root is completed stage 8 is when two third of the root is completed and passage through the alveolar crest is seen at stage 8 also it is the stage at which the tooth erupts in the oral cavity so the actually what happens when we have 3/4 of the root completed that is when the tooth emerges into the 
oral cavity uh, from the gingiva but there is no three fourth root development stage in nola so when they ask about tooth erupts in the oral cavity so that's the stage eight when two third of the tooth or when two third of the root is completed so stage eight of the nola is when the tooth erupts in the oral cavity if they ask about stages of nola if, if they ask in general when the tooth erupts in oral cavity is when three fourth of the root is completed right so we have got two things and when they ask about passage through the alveolar crest is when two third of the root is completed so when they are asking about in the bone so when they are asking about passage through the alveolar crest then two third of the root is completed and when they ask about tooth erupt in the oral cavity then we have Three fourth of the root completed, right? So that's the difference. Now coming to stage eight, nola stage eight is when the tooth erupts in the oral cavity. So very important. Two two third of the root is completed. so when the tooth erupts in the oral cavity it's the stage 8 or passage through the alveolar crest stage 9 is when the root almost completes and 10 is when the root is completed so the tooth emerges from the alveolar gingiva into the oral cavity when 3/4 of the root is completed and this is the question asked in ne 2021 so the tooth emerges into the oral cavity via the gingiva when 3/4 of the root is completed and if they ask about nola stages then it's the stage 8 so classification of occlusion we have predental period that is before the primary dentition or the deciduous dentition that is from 6th month to first eruption deciduous dentition is up till 2 and 1/2 years to 3 and 1/2 years mixed dentition is between 6 to 12 years of age and permanent dentition is when the permanent teeth are in the mouth so post natal dental arches are the quaternary arches and both to 12 months that is i can say 1 year there is increase in the dental arch anteriorly also increase in the palatal vault then there is increase in the posterior so first of all there is tooth germ then there is tooth fill tooth field and then we have maxillary d and then b right so when we talk about 7 to 10 years of age is the time of mixed dentition period so mixed dentition period is between 6 to 12 years right so when the child's development of occlusion is under the supervision which is most critical time when we have to supervise the occlusion of the child is between 7 to 10 years of age so this is the time period we should observe the dentition so 7 to 10 years of age is the time most critical when the child development of occlusion is under supervision and it is the period of mixed dentition which is most dynamic then at the age of 6 years the jaw contain maximum number of teeth that is 48 teeth filling the body of the mandible and at the age of 8.5 years guys very important asked in neat 2016 exam 8.5 years of age a child has got 12 primary teeth and 12 permanent teeth so total 24 and at the age of 6 years we have 48 teeth inside the mandible then also asked in neat 2020 exam that crowding in a 7 year old child how should you treat it 
so we know that this is the time period wherein we are going to supervise it right so this is the time period most critical for supervision we have to supervise it so 7 years of age till 10 years of age when they ask you then we have to review for 6 months again question asked in the need 2020 exam so crowding in 7 7 to 10 years of age time is going to be most crowded most dynamic under supervision most critical so that is the time we are going to we have to observe carefully now mal occlusion most likely occur at mixed dentition period which is between 6 to 12 years of age then most common cause of anterior cross bite in the mixed dentition period is prolonged retention of the primary teeth now understand a concept if the primary teeth understand this concept if a primary teeth okay uh if they fall early if these primary teeth falls early then what happens otherwise there is a socket there is less bone so if these primary teeth falls on time then the erupting permanent teeth has got less distraction in the bone right so that is why they erupt soon but what if these primary teeth uh, fall early then by the time these permanent teeth start erupting there is more dense bone so that means if there is early loss of primary teeth then there will be prolonged eruption of permanent teeth or delayed eruption of permanent teeth right if there is early loss of primary teeth normally what happens when there is a primary teeth about to erupt there is going to be resorption around it right and also you will have a socket so less bone less a uh, distraction for this erupting permanent teeth right because less bone so this permanent teeth will erupt soon but by the time if there is early loss of primary teeth then the again bone will form so this erupting permanent teeth will take more time so that is why if there is early loss of primary teeth there is going to be delayed eruption of the permanent teeth right so now if we talk about most common cause of anterior cross bite in the mixed dentition period also remember cross bite should be treated asap as soon as possible so prolonged retention of the primary teeth crowding after 18 year of age is because of lack of attrition seen in the modern diet modern lifestyle pressure from the erupting third molar and also late mandibular growth can cause crowding after 18 years of age now coming to the pre dental period so pre dental period is from birth to eruption of the first deciduous teeth so natal teeth are the teeth which are present at the birth new natal teeth are one month after the birth usually mandibular incisors mandibular central incisor 85% of the time and also remember rigor fidei disease when because of this natal and neonatal teeth there is ulceration so we have studied sublingual right sublingual traumatic ulceration rigor fidei disease so birth to 6 month of time is the pre dental period we have characteristic features of gum pads so gum pads these are the uh, upper and lower right upper gum pad is horseshoe shape horseshoe shape and lower gum pad is u shape and rectangular and they meet at molar area they contact at the molar area therefore if they are contacting at molar area anteriorly there is going to be open bite so the maxillary gum pad if you see we have got incisive papilla over here incisive papilla and if you demarcate the labial and palatal we have dental groove so this is the dental groove and we have over here dental uh, sorry gingival groove and between the canine and the molar we have lateral sulcus right also there are transverse groove that are 10 in number so like this these are transverse groove 
they are 10 in number for each erupting tooth germ. So this is a mandibular gum pad alveolar process at the time of birth is the gum pad. Right. Then we have self-correcting anomalies. So we know that there is anterior open bite because the gum pads are contacting at the first molar area, right? So there is anterior open bite. This anterior open bite is corrected when the eruption of primary incisors takes place. Also, there is retrognathic mandible and it is corrected after the growth of mandible takes place. We see infantile swallowing and that is converted to adult swallow after the start, after the child start having solid food item. So then coming to the deciduous dentition, the characteristic of deciduous or primary dentition is no curve of speed, slight overjet and overbite, vertical inclination of the incisors Remember this point, the incisors are vertically inclined for primary teeth. And spacing, if the space, see, spacing is a characteristic of primary dentition. If no spacing is present at primary or deciduous dentition, then the permanent dentition is going to be crowded. So spacing is a characteristic and the physiological spacing is known as primate space that is present in the deciduous dentition period. So primate space, space is mesial to maxillary canine and distal to mandibular canine. So mesial to maxillary and distal to mandibular is the primate space. This is 4 millimeters for maxilla and 3 millimeters for mandible. Now coming to the primary molar relationship. For a deciduous dentition, we take distal to the E that is second deciduous molar. So this is the E tooth which is second deciduous molar and distal to that we see the molar relationship. While on the other hand molar relationship for permanent teeth is seen with the permanent first molar. For primary we take distal surface of the second deciduous molar. For primary we take distal surface to the second deciduous molar. For permanent we take first molar relationship that is the difference between molar relationship between the primary and the permanent dentition so this is the flush terminal plane this flush terminal plane mostly result into end on end relationship Im that means immediately this is end to end means both are at the same line maxillary e mandibular E that is the second deciduous molar both are in a same line they will result in end to end relationship immediately but later on after they utilize primate space or leeway space they will be in a class 1 permanent molar relationship so that is on later stages once they take up either primate space or leeway space. Primate space is mesial to maxillary canine, distal to mandibular canine, which is a physiologic space, spacing present in the primary dentition or the deciduous dentition. Now talking about the second, always see the step, right? If it is saying mesial step, so first of all, draw a line to the distal surface of the mandibular E. Then if it is saying mesial step, I mean, uh, mesial step right so this mesial step is mesially right it is for mandible that means mandible is going to be more mesially so this is a mesial step right now 14 percent of the times it will convert into class one and rest of the time either it will convert to a class one relationship or a class three relationship distal step Right, distal step that is posteriorly it will result in a class 2 relationship. So class 1 relationship either can be from a flush terminal plane or can be from a mesial step. Most of the time class 1 molar relationship is from a flush terminal plane. But it can also be from a mesial step remember this. So mesial step is remember the mandibular molar. 
when the mandibular molars are mesially it's a mesial step when the mandibular molar are distally it is distal step and also in the ortho what we study distal occlusion is class 2 molar relationship right so distal step is class 2 relationship self correcting anomalies for deciduous dentition is anterior deep bite anterior deep bite will be corrected with the growth of mandible and also atresion of the incisors and when there is eruption of permanent molars spacing correction will be after the eruption of permanent incisors and edge to edge relationship will be corrected with the eruption of permanent incisors also flush terminal plane will be corrected with the eruption of the first permanent molar that is teeth number 6 or it can be by utilizing late leeway space late mesial shift that is leeway space of nans then talking about the mixed dentition period between 6 to 12 years of age successional teeth they are going to replace the teeth is is asectional means they are not going to replace phases of mixed dentition we have first transition period second transition period and in between we have intertransitional period so first transition period is when the first permanent teeth erupt which is first molar right six so emergence of the first permanent molar and replacement of the incisors so primary incisors are going to replace to the permanent incisors so ir- eruption of six and exchange of incisors deciduous incisors with the permanent incisors so the flush terminal plane which is distal surface to the e this is the flush terminal plane immediately will result into end to end relation but later on it will change to a class 1 molar relationship utilizing two spaces if early shift if they utilize the space early then they are going to utilize the mesial shift which is the primate space that is mesial to maxillary distal to mandibular canine mesial to maxillary canine distal to mandibular canine is the prim- primate space physiologic space when they utilize this space late so if there is a late mesial shift of molar then that is a leeway space of nans that is a leeway space then also we see exchange of incisors and the difference in the space the primary incisors are small the permanent incisors are large and the difference in the space is known as incisal liability and this incisal liability for maxillary it is 7 mm for mandibular the incisal liability is 5 mm remember incisal liability for maxillary is 7 mm for mandibular 5 mm so incisal liability exchange of primary incisors with the permanent incisors the difference in the space for maxilla it is 7 mm for mandible it is 5 mm intertransitional period is between these periods and it's stable for 1.5 years then second transitional period is when c d and e that is deciduous canine deciduous first and second molar are replaced by the permanent canine and the permanent premolars premolars are only present in the permanent teeth so the replacement of cde with 3 4 5 is known as leeway space of nans also in the second transitional period we see the ugly duckling stage which is associated with the eruption of the canine ugly duckling stage 8 to 9 years of age we see this stage and as a result of that we see midline diastema so leeway space is when when c d and e see the molars are going to replace with the premolars always remember for primary the molars are going to replace with the premolars so the distance is going to be less the space is going to be less so 3 4 and 5 will occupy less space and this space is known as leeway space of nans 
and for mandible this space is more because there is going to be mesial shift right for mandible this space is 1.7 millimeter each side and for maxilla this space is total 1.8 millimeter so total 1.8 millimeter now if you add 1.7 and 1.7 to each side then for mandible it is going to be 3.4 millimeter total and from 1.8 millimeter if you divide in each side it is going to be 0.9 millimeter each side so that is the leeway space of nans very very important leeway space of nans 1.5 millimeter each side for mandible maxilla it is 1.8 millimeters total ugly duckling stages when the canines are erupting they are going to push the roots of the lateral incisor so because of that there is going to be a midline diastema lesser than 2 millimeters if it is more than 2 millimeters that means we may require orthotherapy so in the uh, in the ugly duckling stage we see this midline diastema also there is deep bite seen in the ugly duckling stage overjet overjet and disto angular inclination of the maxillary incisors leading to the midline diastema so also disto angular axial inclination of the inclination axial inclination of the maxillary incisors which will lead to the midline diastema now the self correcting anomalies of the mixed dentition period is the mandibular anterior crowding anterior deep bite ugly duckling stage will result in the midline diastema and uh, end on relationship now there is safety valve that is these permanent teeth are larger in size compared to the primary teeth right so there is also going to be increase in the distance of canine as the child grows so this increase in the intercanine width at the years of 12 age is the safety valve so safety valve for mandible male it is 4 mm for maxilla males it is 6 mm for females for mandible it is 4 mm and for maxilla females it is 4.5 mm now coming to the permanent dentition so the class 1 molar relationship is when the mesobuccal cusp of the maxillary first molar coincide with the buccal groove of the mandibular first molar for class 2 molar relationship the disto buccal cusp of the maxillary first molar coincide with the buccal groove of the mandibular first molar and the class 3 relationship is when the mesobuccal cusp is between the mandibular first molar and the mandibular second molar so basically class 3 molar relationship is when there is a mandible prognathism right and class 2 relationship is when there is maxilla prognathism so that's the difference now curve of sp is touching the cusp tip making a circle of 4 inch diameter curve of wilson is the bucco lingual inclination of the mandibular teeth is going to be convex this is the wilson curve then we have six keys of occlusion these are given by andrews class 1 molar interarch relationship that is the that is the mesobuccal cusp of the maxillary first molar coincide with the buccal groove of the mandibular first molar then we have mesiodistal crown angulation that is the angulation of the crown mesiodistally then we have labiolingually so mesiodistally labiolingually crown inclination then absence of rotation 6 uh, sorry absence of rotation 4 5 is 
tight contact six is curve of spee and the new one is the boltons ratio the seventh andrews key of occlusion so curve of spee should be less than 1.5 mm now coming to the fluorides so from the floor meaning flow 9 and 19 history of fluoride is starting from the doctor mckay in 1909 in the colorado colorado springs mckay studied colorado brown stains and these stains he called mottled enamel then dr trendle h dean so dr dean he studied 10 cities 10 states sorry and 22 cities or 21 cities some books has written 21 so he studied he did a survey which is known as shoe leather survey because he covered so many cities 10 states 22 cities so that is known as this survey was done by foot so that is known as shoe leather survey in that survey what he concluded is when the fluoride level are high in the water then he see the mottled enamel that is discoloration of the enamel he also studied this discoloration is related to the level of fluoride so if there is less than or equal to 1 ppm of fluoride in the water then there is no mottling if the fluoride content is 2.5 3 ppm then there are chalky white stains in the teeth if there are 3 ppm fluoride level then there is mottling of the enamel if the fluoride concentration is 4 ppm then he studied there is enamel mottling along with that pitting is present so this 21 or 22 cities is covered by the dean known as shoe leather survey in that he also studied one more thing he studied that if fluoride level are high in the water then there are less amount of caries so the fluoride concentration in the water is inversely related to the caries so from that he concluded that fluoride can decrease the amount of caries so the fluoride is anti cariogenic or fluoride has got a cariostatic effect now what happens there are bacteria when they come and attach to the plaque they are going to secrete the acid right this acid would lower the ph and we have dissolution of the minerals in the enamel so because of this acid there is dissolution of the crystals of enamel now what happens when you give fluoride or when you apply fluoride to it so there is going to be acid resistant crystals which will not dissolve from the acidic effect of the bacteria so there will be crystals staying as it is see this demineralization which is a uh, demineralization of the enamel crystals which is happening because of the acid secretion from the bacteria this acid secretion from the bacteria will lower the ph will dissolve the enamel crystals and it will result in demineralization of the crystals so mineral content is lost from the enamel crystals so demineralization of the crystals which happen but when you apply fluoride there will be remineralization again 
the crystals enamel crystals will get the content will get the crystals come back again so there will be remineralization of the enamel on the fluoride application also with the fluoride we see the crystals has become more resistant to the acid the size of crystals have increased there is decreased solubility from the acid and this particular effect of the fluoride on the crystals of the enamel is known as karyostatic effect and that is why the fluoride help in preventing the dental caries now we have fluoride either applied topically it can be applied professionally by a dentist or can be self applied by a patient also we have fluoride given systemically so systemically fluoride can be given in the water as water fluoridation can be given with the salt known as salt fluoridation can also be given in the diet in the diet it can be given with the milk it can be given in the tablet form or can be used as a mouth rinse or mouth wash so fluoride concentration in the human breast milk is 5 to 10 microgram per liter of the breast milk fluoride concentration in the earth crust is 300 parts per million that is 0.06 to 0.09 percentage fluoride concentration in the dry tea leaf is between 100 to 400 ppm fluoride concentration in the dental plaque is 15 to 64 ppm and fluoride concentration in the sweat is 0.067 to 0.05 ppm now the most important point is the who recommendation how much should be the fluoride so it is between 0.7 to 1.2 parts per million so one what do you mean by ppm parts per million is 1 mg fluoride per liter of water so if you give 1 ppm remember if you give 1 ppm of the fluoride that will reduce 50% of the caries so 1 ppm of the fluoride will reduce 50% of the caries now the who gave a variation between 0.7 to 1.2 ppm that means it depends on the water during the cold climate the person drinks less of water that means we have to put little bit more fluoride content fluoride content will be on higher side in the hot climate a person drinks more water that means the water concentration the fluoride concentration in the water is going to be on a lower side because a person drinks more of water in a moderate condition we keep it 1 parts per million hot we give 0.7 parts per million of what of the fluoride in the water and for cold climate we give 1.2 ppm of water according to who so remember the who recommendation for moderate climatic condition it is 1 ppm for cold climate it is going to be on a higher side uh, as you can remember we drink less of water so 1.2 ppm and for hot it is 0.7 ppm so the who recommendation is 0.7 ppm to 1.2 parts per million now the school water fluoridation since the child is in a certain time limit uh, during the day in the school so it is going to be a bit higher than 1 ppm so 4.5 to 6.3 ppm salt fluoridation we use sodium fluoride we use potassium fluoride so initially we used to put 90 ppm in the salt now we put 250 ppm and in the countries like india the salt fluoridation is one of the economical method milk fluoridation has got sodium fluoride calcium fluoride disodium monophosphate disodium silico fluoride the dose is 0 to 1 mg fluoride per day so the concentration for milk fluoridation is 2.5 to 7 ppm 
as we drink milk lesser than the water that is why slightly higher than the water fluoridation then in the tablet we have sodium fluoride sodium fluoride is the one we consume in the tablet form and we have sodium fluoride tablets coming in 0.55 mg 1.1 mg and 2.2 mg tablets then toothpaste if you take say suppose that's a toothbrush toothpaste if you take 1.1 mg of toothpaste if you take that contains 1000 to 1450 ppm so 1 mg 1 mg to 1.45 mg of the toothpaste contains 1000 to 1450 ppm of the fluoride and a small pea size toothpaste a small pea size toothpaste contains 250 small pea size toothpaste is what we recommend for primary dentition for child it contains 250 milligram fluoride so also fluoride can be given as drops lozenges and mouth rinse so remember mouth rinse should be given for a person more than seven years of age it is contraindicated for less than seven years of age because the child can drink it rather than rinsing it so for mouth rinse daily application daily application is for 0 0.05 percentage of fluoride that will contain 225 ppm of fluoride and for weekly dailies for weekly or fortnight point two zero percentage of fluoride that is 900 ppm fluoride so mouth rinse very important contraindicated for less than seven years of age a daily mouth rinse will have a fluoride concentration of 0 0.05 percent and weekly will be much much higher than daily right so that is 0 0.20 so daily 0 0.045 percent and weekly 0.20% daily is 0.045% and weekly is 0.20% very important mouth rinse now the recommended daily dietly fluoride supplement first of all remember that if a child is less than two years of age we do not give dietary fluoride sodium fluoride is what we use in the dietary fluoride I have told you about the dose 0 0.55, 1.1 and 2.2 milligrams. Fluoride concentration in drinking water if it is less than 0.3 millimeter, 0.3 ppm. And if the child is between 0 to 6 months, then we do not give any dietary. For 2 years, so remember, uh, first of all, for 2 years we do not give any dietary fluoride supplement. So, for, uh, for both to 6 months, there is going to be no dietary fluoride of sodium fluoride and if the child is between six months to three years and if the water fluoride concentration is less than 0.3 ppm then we can give supplementary in the diet 0.25 milligram if the fluoride content in the drinking water is more than 0.3 ppm then we do not give any fluoride for six months to three years for three years to six years if the fluoride concentration in the drinking water is less than 0.3 ppm then we give 0.5 milligram of the dietary fluoride if the fluoride concentration in the drinking water is between 0.3 to 0.6 ppm then for a three to six year of old child we give 0.25 milligram of sodium fluoride in the diet and that's the question has been asked in the 2021 exam so this table is very very important 
Now, if a child is between 6 years to 16 years and if the fluoride concentration in the drinking water is less than 0.3 ppm, then we give 1 milligram of sodium fluoride as a dietary supplement. If the water concentration in the drinking, if the fluoride concentration in the drinking water is between 0.3 to 0.6 ppm, for a 6 years to 16 year old child, we give 0. 5 milligram and if the fluoride concentration in drinking water is more than 0. 0.6 ppm then we do not give any fluoride tablet remember if the fluoride concentration in the drinking water is more than more than 0. 0.6 ppm then we do not give any supplement whatever the child age is so, no fluoridated tablets till 2 years of old. The percentage of caries reduction with the school water fluoridation is 40%. With the community water fluoridation is much higher that is 50 to 60%. For dietary supplements, it is 50 to 85%. Remember, 1 ppm of fluoride re reduces 50% of the caries. Fluoride dentifies 20 to 30 percent and topical application if it is applied professionally then there is 30 to 40 percent caries reduction and if it is applied by patient then 20 to 25 percent reduction. Now the professionally applied fluoride we have sodium fluoride, stannous fluoride and APF that is acylidated phosphate fluoride. Remember this stannous fluoride, stannous fluoride is three times more effective than the sodium fluoride and APF is 1.5 percent more effective than the sodium fluoride. So both are more effective than the sodium fluoride but sodium fluoride is the one which is more most frequently used especially in the supplements. So sodium again this from this table question has been asked in NEET 2021 so this is a very high yielding table. Sodium fluoride contains 9000 ppm of fluoride. Stannous fluoride contains 19000 and APF 12300. So 19360 stannous fluoride, APF 12300. So first of all, remember how much ppm is the fluoride. For sodium fluoride, it is 9000. For stannous fluoride, it is 19000. And APF, it is 12000. So, for sodium fluoride, it is 9040 ppm. For stannous fluoride, it is 19360 ppm. And for APF, it is 12300 ppm. So, 12300 ppm and also... Also, we have 1.23 percentage of, of APF. So, very easy to remember 12.3, 12,300 ppm and 1.23 percentage APF. For stannous fluoride, we use 8 percent of the stannous fluoride which contains 19,360 ppm of stannous fluoride. Then for sodium fluoride, we use 2 percent. So, 2% sodium fluoride contains 9,040 ppm. 8% of stannous fluoride, 19,360 ppm. And 12,300 ppm, 1.23% of APF. Now, the pH of sodium fluoride is most closest to the a neutral pH, that is a 7 pH. So, it can be stored in the plastic container. On the other hand, if you see pH of stannous fluoride and APF, they have got an acidic pH. So, pH of stannous fluoride is 2.4 to 2.8 and the stannous fluoride can cause pigmentation, metallic taste in the mouth after using fluoride and also you should uh, mix it fresh every time. Then APF again can be used in gel and liquid and the pH is 3 contained in the plastic. The technique which we use, so sodium fluoride, we use it at the age of 3, 7, 11 and 13 
and it is applied for 4 minutes. So 20 milligram of sodium fluoride, 1 liter of water, then we mix it and the technique is known as Nutson technique for sodium fluoride, Muller technique for stannous fluoride and Brudewald technique for APF. So caries reduction is most for stannous fluoride that is 30% caries reduction but remember metallic taste and also pigmentation associated with the stannous fluoride and every time you have to prepare a fresh mix. So take a capsule then uh, mix it in 10 ml of distilled water and that is how you prepare it. You apply once every year stannous fluoride but Sodium fluoride is applied for four times at the age of 3, 7, 11, 13. Nutson and Fieldman technique is what we use and it reduces 29% of the caries. APF gel is nowadays most commonly used. APF gel especially Brudewald technique and that's a thixotrophic gel. Once you apply or load it on a tray, place it in the mouth. So under stresses, it is going to may, uh, be fluid. Now coming about the fluoride varnishes, the most common one we have is a Durefart. So the maximum fluoride concentration up till now is seen in the Durefart that is 22,600 ppm. And if you see the APF has got up till 12,300, right? Stannous fluoride 19,000. If you remember toothpaste, so one, uh, uh, one, mg of toothpaste contain 1000 ppm fluoride so 1000 ppm fluoride for toothpaste and 19000 for stannous fluoride for apf 12000 but maximum for durafat so if you see the amount of fluoride in the ppm maximum for durafat that is a fluoride varnish so sodium fluoride is the one which we use in the durafat and it is most effective since it has got a concentration of 22,600 ppm. Very important. Also, floor protector also has got a high content of fluoride that is 7,000 ppm of fluoride. So, 0.7% polyurethane based liquor in the chloroform. Then, a higher amount of fluoride can also cause fluoride toxicity. So, safety tolerated dose is a safe dose. That is 1 milligram of fluoride per kg body weight of the person or of the child. So, safety tolerated dose is 1 mg per kg. Potentially lethal doses or probably toxic dose means above this dose, there is going to be toxicity that will be lethal. So, that is 5 milligram of fluoride per kg body weight acute lethal dose is 6 to 9 milligram fluoride per kg and certainly lethal dose means if the person consumes this dose certainly it's going to be deadly or lethal that is 32 to 64 milligram of fluoride per kg body weight so certainly lethal dose is 32 to 64 milligram fluoride per kg body weight. What if a person have got a fluoride toxicity? So immediately any toxicity you have to induce the vomiting so that it comes out and then you give fluoride replacement at home. What you can do is you can give milk. So milk will decrease the fluoride absorption. Then if the dose is less than 5 milligram per kg body weight, you can induce vomiting and you can also give milk. If it is more than 5 milligram per kg body weight, so more than 5 milligram, 5 milligram fluoride per kg body weight is potentially lethal or it can be a probably toxic dose, right? If it is more than 5 milligram per kg body weight, that is 6 to 9, that is acute lethal dose. So, you have to induce the vomiting, you have to give milk, also hospitalize the person and in that we give 5% calcium gluconate. Then, if it is more than 15 milligram per kg body weight, then slowly we have to give infusion of 10% calcium gluconate. Defluoridation is when already 
in the water there is too much of fluoride we have to reduce the fluoride concentration because it will cause mottling of the enamel so there are two techniques the cation exchange and the nalgonda technique which is given in the nagpur that is by neri so nalgonda technique and cation exchange so cation exchange we have d fluorone 1 d fluorone 2 magnesia and carbine the nalgonda technique given by neeri in the nagpur we have to add lime alum and bleaching powder so let me write sodium hypochlorite bleach so lime alum and bleaching powder so rapidly we mix this water at 10 to 20 revolutions per minute for 30 to 60 seconds then there is flocculation that means floc flocculation will be there so that is 4 2 to 4 revolutions per minute very slowly they will uh, revolve for 10 to 15 minutes so rapid mixing is only for 1 minute 30 to 60 seconds but flocculation is for 10 to 15 minutes then there is sedimentation that is the water stops now it's not moving any more then sedimentation is for 90 minutes and then we filter this and store it in a overhead tank you can store up to 22 liters of water and then this water can be used for drinking purposes that is how we remove the excess fluoride now so in this we add alum bleach and lime so plasma peak of fluoride reach within 180 minutes and renal clearance of fluoride is 30 to 50 ml per minute then the most reliable method for fluoride analysis in the food is micro diffusion technique given by tevis then the fluoride ion electrode responds to free uncomplex fluoride ion in the solution and fluoride is contraindicated in chronic renal failure so in chronic renal failure the fluoride is contraindicated and 100% fluoridated country is hong kong and singapore now coming to the dental caries we have the most common caryogenic bacteria is streptococcus mutans remember streptococcus mutans the most common caryogenic so the bacteria which most commonly causes caries the bacteria which initiate caries is streptococcus mutans initiate caries the one which progress the caries is going to be lactobacillus so the bacteria which comes and sits on enamel is streptococcus mutans the one which will take caries from enamel to dentin is going to be lactobacillus so the first one is streptococcus mutans always remember the first one is streptococcus mutans the bacteria which initiate caries the most common bacteria involved with the caries is streptococcus mutans so the most common bacteria or the major bacteria which is involved with the caries is streptococcus mutans the one which initiate the caries is streptococcus mutans so the window of infectivity bacteria which is involved with is going to be streptococcus mutans so window of infectivity guys uh, maximum number see maximum if they ask you maximum number of streptococcus mutans will be seen in window of infectivity to remember easily remember when the first time tooth erupts is going to be the time when there are more number of streptococcus mutans so how you can remember is when the primary teeth erupts most probably 6 months of age right so remember 7 months so 6 months to 2 and 1/2 years of time is when 2 and 1/2 to 3 and 1/2 years when the deciduous teeth are there right so that is 7 month add 1 month extra so 6 month to 1 and 1/2 to 2 years right 1 uh, and 1/2 to 2 and 1/2 years uh, years then 7 to 31 months is the first window of infectivity and you know streptococcus mutans uh, 
actually is transferred from the mother's kiss. So from mother to child, which bacteria is transmitted is the Streptococcus mutans. So remember, Streptococcus mutans window of infectivity. First one is when the first time teeth erupt, seven months to thirty-one months. Second one is when the permanent teeth start erupting. So that is six months of six years of age, right? Six to twelve years of age is the time for mixed dentition period. So remember, the second window of infectivity is the mixed dentition period. So six years to twelve years. The Mixed dentition period is when the second window of infectivity. So, if they ask you maximum number of Streptococcus mutans is seen, either if in the option first window of infectivity is there, or in the option if second window of infectivity is there, that is going to be the answer. And the same kind of question has been asked in NEET 2019. So, remember window of infectivity Streptococcus mutans. Streptococcus mutans and Streptococcus sobrinus both are the bacteria associated with smooth surface caries. So remember S S Streptococcus, smooth surface caries. So smooth surface caries, Streptococcus mutans and Streptococcus sobrinus. Lactobacillus is the one which progresses the caries. So progression of the caries via Lactobacillus. Initiation of the caries is via Streptococcus mutans. Progression of the caries is via Lactobacillus. So, what initiates the caries is Streptococcus mutans, which progresses the caries is going to be Lactobacillus. Also, pit and fissure caries. Pit and fissure caries, Lactobacillus. Dentin caries, Lactobacillus. Dentinal caries. Etiology of dental caries, Actinomycetes is root surface caries. Root surface caries is Actinomycetes. Then etiology of dental caries, chemical theory, parasitic theory, Miller scheme, parasitic theory, or proteolytic theory. Now, what happens? First of all, there is bacteria on the tooth, and this bacteria releases acid. This acid is going to dissolve the crystals of the enamel. That is demineralization of the crystals, which takes place, right? So, when the demineralization of crystals start taking place, that is incipient lesion. That is when the first time caries starts, right? So, which is a subsurface lesion. Subsurface lesion. Now, what happens? This incipient caries is the white spot. When this bacteria reaches up to the dentine, then there is a cavitation. That means the hole is what we see. So, this is when it reaches to the dentine, then it becomes cavitated lesion. Cavitated lesion is when we see the dental caries, cavitated hole. Now, we have caries triad, keys triad associated with the dental caries. So, we have three things. Triad, we have three things. Host, agent, substrate. And one more element is added that is environment. So host is the tooth which will host the bacteria and that will lead to dental caries. Agent is the bacteria which causes dental caries. Substrate is the carbohydrates or the sticky sugars. Environment is plaque, saliva. Then we have buffering action of the saliva saliva is going to restrict the caries so it has got a buffering action of saliva due to presence of bicarbonates urea and protein present in the saliva then the lysozyme breaks the bacterial cell wall and therefore inhibits the action of the bacteria if there is adequate saliva, then saliva will dilute and this buffer action will result in less tooth damage. So, it is going to buffer the acidic environment created by the bacteria. Salivary flow, stim unstimulated salivary flow is going, to, when, when we say it is less, when it is less than 0 0.1 milligram per minute. And stimulated salivary flow is when we ask the patient to have chewing gum 
and then if it is less than 0.5 ml per minute then we say it's less otherwise the saliva is going to have a inhibit reaction on the growth of the bacteria that is it is going to prevent the dental caries then we apply fluoride fluoride has got anti cariogenic role that means it is going to stop the flow uh, caries activity how by increasing the resistance having anti microbial effect and by remineralization of the enamel crystals so this fluoride it combines with the hydroxyapatite crystals present in the enamel and forms fluor hydroxyapatite these fluor hydroxyapatite have got resistance to the acid secreted by the bacteria so therefore they have got more resistance for this acid environment so critical ph for demineralization or dissolution of the crystals of enamel is 5.5 to 5.2 ph the in interproximal plaque the ph drops for 120 minutes so we have recent technology like di diagnodent in diagnodent there is infrared laser light right this laser light has got 650 or 655 nanometer of the wavelength this is a fiber optic light and it releases this infrared light fluorescent it gives the reading of 0 to 99 and if it is more than 20 then we say caries are present so this diagnodent is useful in detecting the smooth surface caries smooth surface caries but it requires a dry occlusal surface so confirm the presence or absence of caries in otherwise suspicious area so they are very good at indicating the presence of a deeper lesion either they are present in enamel or dentine if they are not visible clinically or in radiograph but unable to reliable indicates the depth of the dentinal caries so diagnosis of the smooth surface caries if they ask in the question then the answer is going to be diagnodent since it is going to diagnose the smooth surface caries now talking about di40 that is digital imaging fiber optic trans illumination which gives a picture in a computer so it is a ccd it gives a image it is helpful in the hidden caries it detects the hidden caries all the hidden occlusal pit and fissure then we have qualitative uh, sorry quantitative light fluorescent that is qlf that detects early caries early detection of the caries so we have cat sometimes they ask very simple questions like full form of cat so cat is caries risk assessment risk is not there in the cat so caries risk assessment tool so student get confused they give you a uh, full form related to c a and t and therefore the student get confused and they miss out this part so remember cat is caries risk assessment tool in that we have cariogram and camera so dark blue color indicates the diet red color indicates the bacteria blue color indicates the diet red color the bacteria light blue susceptibility yellow circumstances green chances of avoiding caries so cat which is caries risk assessment tool we have low risk individual high risk individual for caries and moderate risk individual so if a person has not got caries from past 2 years that means the patient is a low risk for caries a high risk is from past 1 year the person is having caries so likewise we have criteria for low risk no caries for 2 years no visible plaque no gingivitis no enamel demineralization or white spots or there is optimal fluoride exposure or if the sugar is at the meal times and socio economic status are high or the regular dental care 
for a moderate risk individual if there are caries from past 2 years if the caries is from past 1 year it's a high risk if the gingivitis is present that means a moderate risk and visible plaque is present that that means the patient is high risk if there is one area of enamel demineralization or caries or white spot then there is a moderate risk for caries and the person falls in high risk criteria if there is more than one area or radiographically we can say enamel hypoplasia or enamel caries if suboptimal fluoride systemic and optimal fluoride topical then it's a moderate risk if suboptimal both systemic and uh, topical then it's a high risk if the sugar is occasionally between the meals one to two times then it's moderate if frequently between the meals more than three times then it's a high risk if the socio economic status is mid then moderate if low then high risk if irregular dental checkup then moderate risk and if there is no dental checkup and if the person is having ortho appliance then it's a high risk or any special need patient will also have a high risk caries now talking about sweeteners so we have sucrose which is a arch criminal or the most cariogenic so remember very important point sucrose is the arch criminal they ask you such a simple question like the most cariogenic or the arch criminal is the sucrose then we have xylitol which has got anti cariogenic so it decreases the streptococcus mutans so streptococcus mutans which initiate the caries and uh, involved with the window of infectivity also most common bacteria associated with the caries now we have sweeteners classification right sucrose is the arch criminal the caloric sweeteners are xylitol sorbitol mannitol and lycosin and non caloric sweeteners we have s partum and saccharin saccharin then dulkin aldoxymes and cyclamates are also non caloric sweetener then plant derived we have stevia and monilin now what are the dye used in caries detection if you want to use a dye for enamel caries then you can remember kfc so which is a k uh, somehow remember from enamel and f and c are fuchsin dye and c is the calcin dye so calcin fuchsin and zio zl22 for dentinal caries it's very easy to remember it is only a so both starts from a which is the acid red system and alpha amino acridin acridin so this is to uh, stain the dentinal caries now drawback of stain is it not only stains the teeth parts but also it stains the hypoplastic part now the elements that increases the caries are lead also barium increases dental caries selenium and cadmium anti cariogenic or that control the caries are vitamin k because it interferes with the bacterial growth and valionella because it lack the enzyme that are used for hmp shunt or glycolysis so that's why it inhibits the caries dental cripple is a child who has lost many teeth now the difference between infected dentine and affected dentine see infected dentine is infected right so it cannot be remineralized again but affected dentine uh, can be remineralized again so infected is remember it has got infected so much that there is no going back it cannot be repaired at all it has to be removed so it's a highly demineralized it cannot be remineralized 
and it lacks the sensation it has to be excavated it has to be removed and the stain which we use to stain the infected dentin is 1% acid rich solution and 0.2% propylene glycol so that is very important the stain which we use to stain the infected dentin remember this stain is used for infected dentin so we know that if we use 1% acid red in 0.2% propylene glycol then that is going to stain infected dentin which has to be removed it cannot be remineralized again so that is a highly demineralized dentin now when you see the affected dentin it is it is immediately demineralized therefore it can be remineralized again it's a sensitive dentin it cannot be stained and left for remineralization morphology of pit and fissure u and v fissures so if you see u and v fissures they can be cleanse there is space in between right they can be cleanse so u and v they are self cleansable they are caries resistance and we can use non invasive technique right i and k on the other hand they are kerry susceptible and invasive technique you have to use so chemo mechanical kerry is removal technique we have two things kerry dex and kerry solve kerry solve has got solve name therefore it's not solution it's a gel kerry dex on the other hand it's a solution so kerry dex contains sodium hypochlorite and it contains glycine amino butyric acid sodium chloride sodium hydroxide kerry solve which is a gel it comes in two syringes sodium hypochlorite 0.5 to 1% in the one syringe other syringe contain lysine all the amino acid leucine and glutamic acid also it contain arthrosine dye which stains pink now kerry dex contains sodium hypochlorite glycine amino butyric acid sodium hydroxide and sodium chloride which forms amino butyric acid and therefore it uh, goes deep into the caries new formula for caries is papa kerry papa kerry now talking about early childhood caries the name nursing caries for early childhood caries was given by winter kroll called them nursing bottle mouth sheldon called it nursing bottle syndrome also it is known as night bottle syndrome nursing bottle caries and milk bottle syndrome now this is because of the pacifiers honey dipped pacifiers these uh, bottles if they are dipped in the honey and if they are kept in the mouth and the child sleeps on having them then what happens if you see if there is honey on to this now what happens when the milk is going sweet milk is going inside it is going to make this teeth carious so maxillary central incisor is the one which is affected most by, by the caries by the nursing bottle caries so remember the most commonly involved most commonly involved teeth is the maxillary central incisor and the mandibular central incisor it is protected by the tongue see tongue is protecting the mandibular central incisor therefore in nursing bottle caries the mandibular central incisor is spared so least common or i can say never involved never involved is the mandibular central incisor so the bottle feeding habit with the honey dipped pacifiers is the reason for having a nursing bottle caries so how do we prevent this kind of caries we know the most common involved teeth is the maxillary central incisor so the ch child should start brushing the teeth after first eruption of the teeth right and the first visit dental visit should be 6 months after the eruption of first teeth or within one year when we say it's a severe early childhood caries when we say this a nursing bottle caries is severe 
the definition is given by Davis is more than or equal to one decay or missing due to caries or filled in the primary teeth. Remember the teeth involved in the nursing bottle caries is the primary teeth. While on the other hand, rampant caries involve the permanent teeth also. In 71 months or younger. Or younger. So, if you calculate the 71 months, it is going to be 5.9 years. Before 6 years. 6 years onwards, we have mixed dentition, right? We have permanent teeth erupting. So, that is a sign of a severe early childhood caries. See, this typical pattern in second, third or fourth year of child. So, the most commonly involved teeth is the maxillary central incisor that to labial surface. This is the most common involved teeth with the nursing bottle caries. Remember, maxillary central incisor is the one which is most common. Mandibular central incisor is the one which is least common because it is protected by the tongue. Then we have most common is the maxillary central incisor labial surface then we have maxillary lateral incisor then we have maxillary first molar lingual and buccal surfaces maxillary canine and second molar and the least is the mandibular molar then the one which is never involved is the mandibular incisors remember nursing bottle caries mandibular incisors are never involved because they are protected by tongue so then we have clinical features of early childhood caries. So that is, uh, you can go through this table, pause the video and go through this table. Very mild, mild, moderate and severe lesions. So uh, there is going to be first chalky demineralization, then soft and yellow dentine, then brown or black color, then coronal fracture will happen because of this severity of the dental caries. So how do you manage the early childhood caries? Emergency treatment you have to do to relieve the pain, identify, identify the cause. The most important thing is that counsel the parents. That is the most important thing. First is identify the cause, what's causing it. In the first appointment, you have to excavate the caries, active lesions. And if there is any emergency treatment like in a severe early childhood caries, you there can be a sinus tract drainage you can see the sinus tract so you have you may have to drain the abscess counsel the parents do the x-rays oral prophylaxis fluoride application and temporary filling and second visit is after a week you have to do counseling and caries activity test so a uh, caries activity test involves the microbes tells us about the microbes third visit is one week after the second visit that is you do permanent restoration any extraction and after that space maintainers and pulpal procedure review or recall every three months so breastfeeding should be stopped at one and a half years of age then the difference between nursing bottle caries and rampant caries is that in the nursing bottle caries mandibular incisors are never never involved the most common involved are the maxillary central mandibular incisors are never involved for nursing bottle caries while for rampant caries the mandibular incisors are involved so nursing bottle caries is a form of rampant caries which is seen in the primary dentition in toddlers or infants while on the other hand the rampant caries involves permanent as well as primary dentition all the age groups so all teeth are involved for rampant caries while on the other hand maxillary incisors and molars are involved for the nursing bottle caries and mandibular incisors are never involved for nursing bottle caries so nursing bottle caries are because of the bottle feeding habit honey dipped pacifier prolonged breastfeeding and rampant caries can be because of decreased saliva because saliva act as buffer we have bicarbonates urea and proteins that act as buffer and de this decreases the ph therefore saliva has got anti-cariogenic role if there is decrease in the saliva then there can be high chances of having caries such as rampant caries or there can be genetic predilection or frequent snacking habit in a child so the treatment uh, of or pre prevention of the nursing bottle caries is health education counsel the parents and the treatment is the tropical fluoride application for 
rampant caries it's the pulp therapy and rampant caries we call it if there are less than 10 lesions per year the most common bacteria that is involved with the rampant caries is the lactobacillus because the progression of caries is via lactobacillus dentinal caries is lactobacillus so most common caries in primary first molar is present on the proximal surfaces below the contact point and critical ph for enamel caries is 5.5 for dentinal caries is 6 and for root caries is 6.2 to 6.5 so enamel it's hard to get the caries right so guys uh, this finishes the part 1 uh keep reading guys keep revising and keep on solving the multiple choice questions it's very important to solve the multiple choice questions they are the game changer so keep on practicing the multiple choice questions keep on revising uh the crash course contains the high yielding points and remember to solve the multiple choice questions all the best for your exam